What is the greatest thing a person wants to know? I know there are a lot of people that want all sorts of things in life. They need and want all sorts of things. And we have been trained and incentivized in a reality system that forces us to aspire for things, you know, basic things and then aspirational things. But in the end, what is it that really matters? I mean, think of a dying person or a dying man or a dying woman who has lived a long life. Now, when life begins to come to its twilight, human life that is, people are normally concerned about legacy, what they're leaving behind. And people are, at least normal people, they may even have been religious their whole lives. Because religion offers us a kind of explanation or idea regarding the nature of human life, what comes after human life on earth. Now, the thing about, when you really think about it, there was a time when everybody on this planet currently alive today, there was a time when we were not here. And yet there was a planet and there were people on the planet you could almost say that, or you could almost frame it this way, that if you look either side of your own existence, 100 years either side of your own existence, that's the maximal limit within which you can have direct human experience of the world. So 100 years in the past, 100 years in the future. Now everybody alive today, the chances are 90 something percent won't be alive in a hundred years' time. And the chances are that 90 something percent were not alive a hundred years ago. And yet the world continues. The world, the reality system of the world is. Now, what does that tell you? It forces you to imagine that human life is not fundamental. But what are we talking about here? The self. Your, the idea of yourself, I mean, the way that you perceive yourself, the way that you come to know yourself, how could that not be fundamental? Take, for instance, the sun. If you listen to the, to the physicists and the scientists, the astronomers, the sun has been around for 5 billion years. It will probably be around for another 5 billion years. That's a significantly long time. But... From physical theory perspective, the sun is considered very simple. It's a fusing ball of plasma at its core, radiating heat, dissolving the bonds which holds the strong nuclear force which holds its, the, the nucleus of its core together and transforming that into radiation which is throwing everywhere into the, into the universe all around. From a physical theory perspective, it's really simple. And yet, that sun has been around, or is going to be around for about 10 billion years, Earth years. And yet, a human being, which compared to that sun, is indescribably complex. Not just its biology, but its mind. And yet, that has a lifespan of a hundred years. So, which is more fundamental? Now, I'd argue that the human is more fundamental. Why? The sun is simple from physical theory perspective. Because the sun will never know that it's a sun. It will never ask the question for why, of why it is a sun. And it will never be able to choose to do something differently. A human being knows that it's a human being. It can decide to stop acting as a human being and decide to act like a dog if it wants. Or it can decide not to. And yet, the human being's mind and nature is but a hundred years. Now, let me make this known to you now if you haven't really thought about it. This is what disturbs every human being on earth. Every human being that has ever lived on earth 
this is what disturbs them. Now, it's not a conscious disturbance because most people don't go about their day thinking about this, except maybe you're deeply steeped in religion. Most people just carry on their day. But every single human being, as they approach the twilight of their lives, begin to think seriously about death. Considering that one day, someday, they won't be here anymore. Just like there was a time when they were not here. So, the real disturbance that propagates within the deepest part of the human awareness is what happens when I am no longer here? What happens or what was happening before I arrived? Now, if the universe, if existence itself can go on without a hitch before I arrive and then carry on without a hitch as soon as I'm gone, then what is the value of this complexity, this indescribable, unimaginable complexity that is human nature? What is, what is its value, ultimately? You see, because whether anyone had cares to admit it or not, this is what drives people into religion. This is what drives deep philosophical thought. This is what drives, you know, all this, all the narrative we tell ourselves. It is the origin of all the narratives because what people really want to know is the nature of reality. What is reality, really? Okay? And if I'm paraphrasing one of the authors I listen to, who is actually a teacher, Mendel Kesson, in one of his talks, he asked a question. He said, the most important thing a person wants to know in the end is, what is reality? We know most people are concerned about things like power, pleasure, a great reputation. But in the end, everybody wants to know what is out there, really? What is this universe all about? What is the purpose of man? Why is there a universe altogether? And why does it have these laws? Who made the laws? Why this way? Everybody wants to know what reality is. That's the greatest quest of all. End phrase. But that's really what it is. In the back of everyone's mind, if you've ever faced a near-death situation, or if you've ever lost a loved one, or if you've ever experienced finality, you can't help but think about these questions. What is left of me, you, after death? What is reality? What is this universe? What, what, wh why is there a universe at all? Where does it come from? How does it, why does it need to be? And why is it the way that it is? Why do things have, have to die? Why is there... Why do you have this, these laws of physics or laws of universe or whatever you want to call them, these consistency relationships, like entropy, like chaos, like turbulence? Why do you have these degradations like aging? Why is it that the universe at its most larger scales and at, it, at its most smallest scales are extremely simple? Why is there complexity at the mid-range where you have human beings in terms of size scales, that is? Now, most people don't realize that the distance between the smallest possible Planck scale, right, which is called the Planck scale, right, and the average sizes that human beings encounter, including their bodies, compared to the largest possible things in the universe, that is probably the size of the universe itself, compared to the human scale, your everyday reality, that the larger of the two is the scalar distance between the smallest possible, that is the Planck scale, and the size of the human. So if you could shrink yourself to the Planck scale, a human being would be bigger than the entire universe is bigger than a human being today. That's remarkable. Most people don't think about that. So, for all intents and purposes, we could be in a human being. We could be in a, you know, as you shrink and shrink down to the Planck scale, 
everyday objects become universe bigger than the universe would look like the way it is to to us today so if you have for instance your your if you could shrink to the Planck scale, your mother or your father would become bigger than the universe is to us today as we look up into it, scanning it and probing it with our best instruments. That is remarkable. So, what I'm going to do with this conversation is to answer these questions by sidestepping all the religious talk about it. Because... The thing about religion is that it does not satisfy. It does not satisfy in the sense that you need to believe. And, well, you could believe, but not everybody can believe. Some people believe based on conviction, evidence. And so there's a difference between believe in things and knowing things at least from the human point of view and that difference is the nature of conviction so what i want to do with this conversation is to approach the question of what reality is from a physical point of view from a physical theory point of view now the conversation obviously starts from what physicists have identified as the emergence the spontaneous emergence of a universe and when i say when i talk about the spontaneous emergence of the universe it really is the spontaneous emergence of space and time so it makes no sense to think of a time before the universe or a space before the universe those are meaningless concepts in the sense in the con within the context of the birth of the universe because the birth of the universe was and is and will always be the origination of space-time. But space-time is not fundamental. We call it space-time because that is what is derived. That, those are the things you write when you write down equations. We define physics with respect to space and time. But we have to understand that this process is, has a fundamental flaw. Because it is not space and time that we are writing equations about. It is our consciousness, our awareness of self. And I've repeated this in several of my podcasts. Because you got, you know, you are alive and you are aware of yourself and you are aware of a universe that you're studying. And within the context of that awareness, you write down equations over space and over time, trying to describe the behavior of something with respect to space and time. But try thinking of your consciousness without space and time. You couldn't. And I have a lot of podcasts that have touched on this, especially my earlier podcasts. So the question then becomes, what is reality? What's the universe? Where did it come from? Why did there have to be a universe in the first place? Now, hold on to your chair because what I'm going to say might shock you. The universe is existence. And the essence of existence is realization. But realization of what? It is the realization of order. Order. O-R-D-E-R. -E which is a pattern. And what is a pattern? There are many types of patterns. In fact, you can consider the fact that everything is a pattern. Even if you consider in its limit the most patternless thing you can imagine or the most patternless scenario you can imagine that also is a pattern that pattern is called patternless so pattern underlies order order itself is where our mathematics comes from because because remember mathematics is built on axioms what are axioms they are statements fundamental assumptions upon which we build a logical consistency so mathematics itself is an edifice of logic but the logic is derived from axioms, which are considered fundamental. That is, simplistic statements regarding the way that we perceive reality. So, if the universe is existence itself, I want you to think of existence as a fluid. I mean, that's just an analogy because it's not a fluid. But in order to better appreciate the argument that I'm trying to make... 
It's best you think of existence itself as a type of super ultra fluid. Now, the fluid has one characteristic and one particular property that defines it intrinsically. That is, it has the uncanny ability to realize order, to be impressed by order. So that existence itself, the fluid that it is, or the ultra fluid that it is, is a representation of the ability to represent order. Now, what's order? I've just told you, order is a pattern. Now, if you have read my book, The Five Principles of Organized Complexity, I talk about the K pattern a lot. I call it a K pattern. And you'd have to really, really go deep, you know, not so deep, but you have to grab the central argument of my book to piece together all the different uh, descriptions and definitions of the K pattern that I give in the book. But in its most fundamental, irreducible representation, the K pattern is the distribution of prime numbers. It's the most, that's the, it's most simplest explanation or definition. Now, if you know a little bit of mathematics, you understand that there is an isomorphism between the, the natural numbers themselves, the set of all natural numbers, and the prime numbers. Meaning, you can always derive the entirety of all the natural numbers just from the prime numbers. In fact, there is a, there's an interesting uh, formulation by Euler which Riemann eventually used when he uh, tackled the question regarding the distribution of prime numbers. This, there's a sum rule and a product rule that connects the natural numbers to the prime numbers. And so the two sets, are, they are isomorphic to each other. Now, why do I talk about this? That isomorphism and the sets that they link together that's the description that's the most basic description of the k pattern now so that means that that is the most basic description of order now it doesn't matter what the pattern is the pattern could be configured any way possible the most basic representation of that pattern can be reduced to the natural numbers or can be reduced to the distribution of prime numbers and so when we talk about the natural numbers and the distribution of prime numbers, immediately we are referring to the DNA of the K-pattern itself. The, the, the trajectories or the orbits that run within the K-pattern, they are three sixes. I've explained this so many times, I'm not going to go into it. They are the things that sculpt the landscape. And there's a reason for that. You need to listen to some my other podcasts if you want a detailed explanation of why this is constructed this way. So, what does that now tell you? That now tells you what the universe is. The universe itself is a realization of the K-pattern. That's what it is. Every aspect of it. So, when you think about the... Fun, when, you, when you listen to the physical... The latest physical theories regarding the emergence of, the, of what the universe is and how it emerged, you know, physicists are confident they can tell you what happened a trillion, uh, you know, a few in this mind-boggling fractions after the emergence of the universe. The period of uh, cosmic inflation, this is a theory put forward by Alan Guth and, and one or two others. It's an amazing theory. Now, the interesting thing about cosmic inflation is that Alan Guth proposed it as a way of solving certain unique problems that have that were posed by the concept of a Big Bang universe. A universe, you know, I think the Big Bang is, is a very popular term and it is one of the things that got a lot of people very interested in these kind of subjects. And I don't know if the naming of such things in such manner is, is necessary for people to take interest within... Uh, those types of scientific uh, ideas and concepts but it sure did its job everyone talks can easily talk about a big bang and I think of it as some kind of explosion but that's not what it is the big bang itself represents cosmic inflation it does, it's not the beginning of the universe in a sense it's not what brought the universe into existence Mathematically, the universe is supposed to come from a singularity, and a singularity does it. It, it, can, it has no physical description. A singularity is a mathematical point. 
it's the it literally means nothing so and the reason why it's because there's no mathematics that describes a singularity it's just a point of where there is no description nobody you you can't write a, an equation that takes you to that singularity all you know is that it is a point where the theories or the laws that you're using no longer work a typical example is if you're trying to solve a mathematical equation and you get a denominator that is zero that basically just renders the whole thing useless because that's that's unresolvable the axioms of mathematics do not allow for division by zero so obviously something else is going on there it's just that the axioms of mathematics cannot describe what's going on there so you need a new understanding now you have a lot of physicists today pushing for a cyclical universe a universe that emerged from a previous one okay well that's not what i'm going to focus on here what i want to describe is what that singularity is where it came from and the necessity of why it had to exist and all of it comes down to the nature of that k pattern the necessity of order because so people think that you know it's always struck me that it is easy to describe if you ask a lay person describe chaos they'll, they'll easily be able to tell you it's a confusing state something you don't understand etc etc so the world natural things look a bit chaotic in a sense chaos dominates our the scale of human living in terms of we see turbulence for instance you know it's one of the most mystifying things to physicists the, the phenomenon of turbulence you know but turbulence dominates our world non-linear behavior like that dominates the, phys the our physical reality and yet the laws of quantum mechanics are inherently linear and if you believe the physical theories then the classical world which is what we call experience on our scale our size scale the classical world emanates from that linear quantum world in a continuous unbroken flow in a sense because reality is one so all of reality fits together into an unbroken wholeness if you if you if you if you think along those kind of lines and it proceeds to the larger scales in the same unbroken wholeness so the real you know difficulty within all of this is how does a completely linear theory like quantum mechanics lead to a classical world where you experience chaos chaos doesn't exist in the quantum world even though you know there is a sense in which it can exist but not in the rules of quantum mechanics it can exist as a phenomenon but not in the rules that describe quantum behavior it's completely linear okay so that's a difficulty so whatever the singularity is because it's such you experiences you you know physics experiences as the smallest possible thing you know the smallest possible measurement of size or length or distance or whatever you want to call it is currently the Planck scale okay which is something that emerged when quantum mechanics began the singularity is smaller than that it technically has no size meaning it has no features I mean, you look at something like an electron. Electron is thought to be a component of mat of physical matter, right? You can write down properties of an electron. Electron has charge. It has. It can be def deflected by a magnetic field, so it has a little bit of mass. You can write the same thing for all the other fundamental particles. So they have features, describable features. Nobody can write down the features of the singularity from which the universe emerged. It has no features. The only thing people can say about it is that it's it was infinitely dense and probably infinitely hot. But what does what do these mean? How, how do you how do you describe that? No, you can't. Now, the idea of the emergence of the universe is shrouded in mystery. Why? Because there was no time before that emergence. So you cannot say, oh, this was the condition before the universe emerged. In my book, The Five Principles of Organized Complexity, I describe the emergence of that singularity as a dimension change. I actually tell there's a narrative in there that describes the universe as 
starting from a zero-dimensional space, a concept space, a knowledge space, transition into a one-dimensional space, a two-dimensional space, and then emerges into as, emerges as a three-dimensional reality, which is where our own story starts from. That the emergence or the resolving into that three-dimensional reality, which is the birth of space-time you know, as we know it, is what that singularity is. But what is it that was emerging from all of that? What, what is it that came from the K pattern in the zero-dimensional concept space or knowledge space into a one-dimensional space and then into a two-dimensional space and a three-dimensional space? What is it that is changing? It's order. Order. So the if order emerges and see, we know it's order that is emerging. Take a look at the universe that it created. It's an ordered structure. And it has evolved ordered structures. I mean, there's, there's turbulence, there's chaos, but these are all ordered structures. If they weren't, we couldn't study them. Because our, our tool for probing and studying the universe is mathematical. And if it's mathematical, then what we are probing is the order that is contained within these type of realizations. So, what emerged from the singularity is order. And the moment order emerged, it emerged as the simplest example of the K-pattern, which I told you is the distribution of prime numbers, the natural numbers. And within it itself, within its structure, that emerging structure, right, began to inflate because inflation is what it is. I mean, you can look at cosmic inflation whereby... You know, the theory suggests that within a, a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, the universe went from being smaller than a proton to the size of a grapefruit, which analogically simply means that it went from being the size of an onion to 10,000 times the size of the Milky Way galaxy within a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. Now, that. You know, we like to look at such as an expansion of some kind. You know, obviously something got bigger. But there are many ways to look at this. Not necessarily as an expansion. In fact, I am almost convinced that the ex ex an expansion is not really the right way to look at this, at least when you're inside it. Rather, a shrinkage. So rather than the Big Bang, maybe it's best to look at it as a big shrink. Okay, and here are my here are the, here are my reasons. Is because it's space itself that expanded in that sense. We'll continue to use the word expansion until I make my point. But what does it mean for space to expand? Because that's another thing that we're having to deal with today. Because when considering the the expansion of the universe as you know, with so-called dark energy as as the driving force for this type of expansion. What exactly does this mean? It's a metric expansion, meaning it's the ruler of length that is expanding. So one centimeter is becoming larger relative to an absolute fixed measure, if such a thing exists. So a unit length is what is expanding, but you have to have an absolute datum to know that it's expanding. And the absolute datum chosen by science today, by physics today, is light. Now, you can see the expansion in the wavelength of light as it changes color. That's it. But if space is expanding, then the same type of diffeomorphism is also taking place in time. Because well, really, what is time? Time is the perception of space. Time exists because things in space need to change state. Now... If you've been listening to my podcasts for quite some time, you realize that I am an advocate for a reality system that does not change. A reality system that is eternal, it doesn't change. It doesn't need to change because it contains everything that... You have to understand that the change itself is procedural. It's perceptual. It's something that we perceive. It's something that the universe itself perceives as it goes from what you call a small size to a large size. But the reality is that from the point of view of... I know such a thing is not really, you know, it's hard to imagine, but if you imagine the universe as being external of you, then you have to realize that the entire manifestation of existence 
It's done and dusted. It's all complete. Everything came out at once. Everything became what it is at once. There was no time. The full structure emerged to complete the full structure of the K pattern as captured and represented by the fluid of existence emerged out of the singularity at once. And so the entire story is done and dusted. What emerged is a reflection of the K pattern. Not the procedural humming along of the K pattern. You know, that's just for us. Because we are inside the universe. We are part of the universe. So we are tied to it. We are entangled with it. And in order for our sense of self-awareness to emerge, right, we need to have a change of state of that awareness, which is what we call time. But from the singularity itself emerged the distribution of prime numbers. And you say, what does this mean? It's infinite for crying out loud. The set of the distribution, the set of all prime numbers is infinite. Yes. Absolutely. That's why the universe itself is infinite. Okay? That's what drives the expansion of the so-called expansion of the universe. It's not... I mean, we call it... Today, we call it... In the early stage, we call it cosmic inflation. Today, we call it dark energy. But the reality is that it is the mechanical shape, if you want to call it that, of the K-pattern itself. And what we call dark energy today is the universe maintaining this shape, even as symmetries break within it. We, because obviously, from radiation all the way to... We have matter now, we have radiation. I mean, they have separated, and the physical forces of nature have separated from each other in a way. These are symmetry breaks. So they represent a very specific type of supercooling, which is what the inflationary process describes. A, cool, a rapid cooling so if you imagine that the universe emerged as an infinite, infinitely hot, infinitely dense singularity, then inflation is the, the cosmic inflation is the rapid supercooling of this fluid of existence. And as it cooled, it approached critical phase transitions whereby, you know, just like water changes to steam at 100 degrees centigrade, which represents a phase transition, then at critical junctures the exist the inflating existence began to cool and as it cooled certain things crystallized out of it like the forces of nature you know and then the field degree in physics they call it an infliton a scalar field a self-interacting scalar field but that exact that describes the k pattern itself if you've ever seen my model in my book the five principles of organized complexity if you look at the K pattern, you don't know what to call it because there's really nothing that, you know, you can't really find a system that mimics it in its entirety except the whole universe. So you bet one of the first things you realize is that it is the picture or the image or the definition of a system that is interact or an expanding and simultaneously contracting system that is expanding in some dimensions and contracting in some dimensions. But what its key feature is that it is constantly interacting with several scaled copies of itself, infinitely many scaled copies of itself simultaneously. That is the nature of the K-pattern. So in physics, you know, in cosmic inflation, they call this a, an inflaton field. And... It is suggested that this infliton field, a scalar field, degraded. And as it degraded, it crystallized the radiation and fundamental particles like, you know, in the universe. And because of this breakage or this degradation of the field or the breaking of the field into these uh, cooler, much cooler constituents, the energy that was released reheated up the universe completely. So the universe went, that's, it gained a lot of this heat, just like similar to what emerged out of the singularity, although by comparison, much, much less, because what emerged from the singularity is thought to be infinitely hot. But during this reheating process, the universe must, may have, it is suggested that the universe may have gone to about 10 raised to the power minus, 10 raised to the power 27 Kelvin. Or is it 26 now? But anyway... For all intents and purposes, an extremely high temperature. Okay? And then, 
the story proceeds until you get to where we are today, where we are now contending with dark matter and dark energy. But dark energy, like, like I've explained, is a structural thing, you see. It's not really energy per se. It's just that we haven't understood the nature of containment. The universe is like a container. Existence itself is like a fluid that acts like a kind of container, maintaining its rigidity. And it has important ratios to keep. And as matter condenses and becomes us, it compensates its field, its unified fields it compensates that through what we call dark energy today that's really what it is because the truth the reality of the matter is that the net energy manifestation of the universe is zero it always maintains that zero and if you've looked at my model you will realize why the universe appears flat that's really what it is. It's one of the reasons why Alan Guth came up with the theory of inflation. Because he needed to explain the fact that why is the universe flat? And how come the universe is homogeneous in temperature and in structure? As in on its large scales, that on its larger scales, it looks isotropic. It looks homogeneous in every direction. Now, if the expansion of the universe occurred much, much faster than the speed of light, then why does it look properly mixed up? Light wouldn't have had the opportunity to reach every aspect of the universe, to visit every corner of the universe, to mix it all up. Okay? Now, if you've looked at my model regarding the emergence of the K pattern, the result, I call it a, res a resolution. The K pattern resolved as existence. That's what we call a universe. It is the K pattern, which is the distribution of prime numbers, which is the most basic definition of order, resolving itself as an existence. So what are we then? We are simply imageries of that. The K pattern is us. We cannot be anything else. That K pattern is what prescribes, what has, has prescribed every natural phenomenon in existence. It doesn't matter what you're looking at. You could be looking at spiral galaxies. You could be looking at DNA. You could be looking at black holes. You could be looking at the theory of gravitation. You could be looking at turbulence. You could, whatever it is you're looking at. The linking factor for every natural phenomenon, both known and unknown, is the K-pattern. As such, the K-pattern is a model for the universal path integral that is capable of describing every possible physics. Doesn't matter what, whatever kind of physics you can think of, the K-pattern is able to reproduce it. In fact, that is kind of a, like a tautology because... Every possible physics came from the K-pattern. So, but, you know, I'm just trying to... There's an isometry of some kind, you see. So that's, that's really what it is. Now, all the features of the physical laws of physics, all the physical laws of physics, tie back to the K-pattern. They are prescribed. You know, take the masses of, of fundamental particles like a quarks. It is one of my postulates, and it's, this is in my book, that one of the proofs for cosmic inflation is found in the mass of the top quark. Because the top quark is, the mass of the top quark is a mystery. It's, you know, it's 175 GeV. This is huge compared to all the, I mean, the electron is 0 0.5 MeV. So by comparison, you're looking at a change of scale that is just mind boggling. And you have six quarks. And, you know, by the time you go from the lightest quark, which is the up quark, and you go all the way to the top quark, you have a change of scale that is several magnitudes, orders of magnitude large. And you're wondering, why would nature do this? Uh, that's exactly what it's supposed to do to maintain its consistency because that change of scale is exactly how prime numbers or the powers of, of, of primes and even the powers of natural numbers, that's exactly how they behave. That's the scaling inherent within them. If you decide to resolve them into an existence that, you know, that now mimics the concept of distance. That's the scaling. What else is it supposed to be? So that cosmic inflation that you're seeing is also a change of scale. It is a change of scale in space, a change of scale in time. Because that is the change of scale inherent within the infinite set of natural numbers. 
and their powers and all that. You know, you take a number, you scale it up, you, ex- you, scale, you know, you raise it to a power and you keep doing that for all the numbers. And you plot everything as length, then you see what I'm talking about. That behavior, that is the behavior of the K pattern. And that is what is contained. When you look at the masses of, you know, you look at, you ask, why are there six quarks? Why are there six leptons? Three charged and three uncharged. That's because what else can these things mimic? These things, these, these mass, particle masses, they are, you know, they're described as running masses. They're li- literally invariants of the structure of existence, which is the structure of the K pattern which is the structure of how the distribution of prime numbers, how they resolve, how they emerge, or the powers of, of, of natural numbers, how they emerge. You see, when Riemann was, quest- when he was writing his paper, when he was questioning the magnitude of primes less than a given, he was literally inventing the type of geometry that Einstein used to describe his general theory of relativity. But, you know, it all comes from, you know, we're talking about something that is much, much deeper than, you know, I don't know how this is often overlooked in physics. So if you look at my model for the K pattern, you're literally looking at how the universe started. Now, I haven't told you why it started like that, but I just want to deal with the how. So when you if you take if you take my model and you place it on a table, you're looking at it. That's the small part of it I drew on a piece of paper. I tr- I try to scale it up in you know in the in my drawings. I try to so okay. Let's take this. Let's increase the range and see what it gives. What it looks like. What you're really looking at in those drawings is the beginning of existence. What it must have looked like. You want to see what cosmic inflation is. You look at it. You're looking at it. You can see the metric, which is the, met- the same type of metric that works in Einstein's relativity. You can see it on a quantum scale because we're dealing with something now that is possibly even beyond the, what we perceive as being small, even smaller than the Planck scale because we're dealing with unit lengths. It doesn't matter what the unit is. Just like numbers extend forever, there is infinity between one and zero. The natural numbers are things that we don't, you know, we we think we understand everything about, but we don't, not even close. Because we're dealing with the nature of order as can be represented by these natural numbers, relational order. And these are concepts that are deep, 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 deep within our psychology. In fact, you can say for, 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 for a fact that the emergence of human nature and this is the reason why I study astrology is that most people don't get it. They think I study astrology because I'm an astrologer. The nature of human awareness, what we call self-awareness itself, by its very nature, must mimic the structure of the K-pattern. What else could it mimic? Where else would it get its instruction from? Who do you think? How do you think? Where do you think you come from? Why do you have the, the shape, the structure that you do? Why do you have the cognition that you do? You have it because you are the iteration, the latest iteration of something that began even before time. Now, I've been saying these things for years. I've written books. I've written, you know, they all get ignored for a reason. I'm not going to go into that reason right now, but it gets totally ignored. Ideas get rewritten and papers get published, but I'm conveniently totally ignored. There is a reason for that. I won't go into it here, but eventually that reason will... I don't need to say anything about the reason. Everybody will watch the reason with their own eyes when the time comes. So the question now becomes, why did the K pattern resolve into an existence? Okay, now there are two versions of this story. I'm going to tell the simplest version first. Now... And both versions are coming from my book. Everything I'm saying now is in my book, The Five Principles of Organized Complexity. Okay? I have a website called the same name, The Five Principles of Organized Complexity. I have a YouTube channel of the same name. I've been saying these things for years. 
So in the simplest version, the K pattern, which is zero dimensional, meaning it's a concept, but a concept needs to be held by an intelligence. So the existence of the K pattern directly infers the existence of an intelligence that holds the K pattern as its own concept. That's the simplest version. Because that intelligence now, in my book, I call it a primordial consciousness. Meaning a consciousness, and I use the term primordial not to mean old. I, I really couldn't find any other definition. Uh, it, the way I use that term primordial, it doesn't mean old. No, it means before time. And don't ask me what that means. Because I've just told you that there is no before time. Now, the, pri the primordial consciousness is, is, is an intelligence that exists or that even existence connotes time. So even the term, I mean, I have, we have no way to describe these things. So religion interprets this as God and weaves all sorts of narratives around this interpretation. The question now becomes who this primordial consciousness is. Now, its essential nature, meaning its internal intrinsic nature, is unknown and unknowable. And so the way that such a thing represents within human consciousness is, the, is as the form of the absolute blackness. Because that's what it means to be unknown. You know, it's completely... It's, it, because human consciousness is like a light. You know, I'm speaking figuratively now. Because blackness is not a color. I don't mean it in terms of a color black or whatever. Just like when physicists today, they say dark energy. They could easily have called it black energy. But you know, for political correctness, they didn't do that. That would be giving too much away. So they called it dark energy. But it doesn't mean that the energy itself is dark. The darkness is a figurative term for the lack of understanding regarding what that energy form really is. It is within that same context that I'm using the word blackness. I could also call it darkness. Because the essential nature of the primordial consciousness is unknown and unknowable. That's the key thing. It's unknowable. So what's the point? There's no use trying. The only way to know it is by looking at its representation as a concept, which is the, the, the K pattern. The K pattern comes out of it. So I have a podcast that talks about something and nothing. Nothing and organized complexity. That's what the podcast is called. It doesn't have many views, surprisingly, because what I'm saying in that podcast is essentially what I'm saying in this podcast, but just in a different form. Because things get very tricky when you talk about nothingness. What does it really mean? But that's exactly what the primordial consciousness... When I say the primordial consciousness, because I attach a label, primordial and consciousness to it, or intelligence to it, you think I'm talking about a thing. I am not. It has no description whatsoever. There is nothing you can say about it beyond the intelligence that it orchestrates. And you say, oh, that proves the existence of God. Well, if that's what you want to call it, then that's what it is. Because the K pattern itself contains, it can, basically, it is the, the K pattern is the foundation for everything in existence and everything that can possibly be in existence. Remember, I called it the universal path integral. Now, the path integral is one of the key, it's the description of the standard model of particle physics. It's what is used to describe, it's supposed to be a kind of unified field theory, how to connect all the forces, all the particles, everything. But it has a, a lot of, you know, the, the way that it currently is, it has a lot of parameters that you need to add by hand, do, you know, measure based on measurements and experiments and all that. But the K pattern itself, right? is a universal path integral it's beyond it's even beyond that i'm just going to use the universal path integral because i don't know what else to call it meaning that it is capable of reproducing any type of physics whatsoever the consistency is built in within it it is the distribution of prime numbers it is the sixes and you have to understand that the way that the k pattern behaves its outputs begin to scale hierarchically 
they form an infinite layer of gradients. That's why you, me, and everything, you know, those gradients are approximations of what we perceive as time. Because the gradients themselves, infinite number of them, they suggest a change of state. But there's something unique about every gradient. Even though we perceive the change of state on each gradient as an expansion, the unit norm remains the same. And that's why I tell you that the universe from the singularity to what we have today is basically has always remained the same. If you look at it from a holistic point of view, nothing has really changed. I know we see all these, you know, we look because that's because we're immersed in it. We are inside it. We are it. So we perceive a change of state. But the reality of the matter is that there is no change of state from a, from a holistic point of view. Everything has remained the same. It has already occurred. It is occurring. It is trying to occur. All existing simultaneously because there's no time. That's really what it is. So, on to the more complex version. Now, in my book, The Five Principles of Organized Complexity, I talk about, because what do you, and I do this a lot, I digress, I digress a lot, sometimes in between points. That's why my podcasts are literally free forms. I, you know, most of them are free forms. I just record. Okay, so you're going to have to bear with me. That's the way my thinking process works also. In my book, The Five Principles of Organized Complexity, I talk about the need for the analytic continuity of several important counting functions. That's really what it is. It is these which led to the change, the dimensional changes that which now emerged as a singularity. And the reason is because that is what is always happening. It is a necessity. Meaning that you cannot have a situation where a universe is not being born or a universe does not exist. So since the birth of the universe is the birth of space and time, because it is the realization of ex- of order within the fluid called existence, then you can't really have a time where you don't have a universe that is either being born or that is growing. My model does not describe anything like a... Sh- like a uh, you know, some people have a cyclical theory of a universe that ultimately collapse, collapses back into itself and then rebounds into a new Big Bang or inflation or whatever. My model does not show that. Instead, what my model shows is an eternally inflating universe in the sense that a universe that maintains its consistency, its wholeness, its oneness forever. Now, the thing about universe is recollapsing back or universe is forming multiverse i have a podcast that says there's no multiverse this is it all possibilities collapse into one all the time i actually have a term for it it's called the convergence of knowledge spaces we do we do that on a personal level we converge knowledge spaces that's why we're self-aware our self-awareness is the process of converging these knowledge spaces we converge concepts we have a, a mechanism. I'm not going to go into it here because, you know, I still teach this in a paid podcast, on a paid sessions. We have a mechanism that collapses these uh, converging knowledge spaces into and resolves them into a physical reality. And we can only do that as a K-pattern. That's why we're self-aware. You see? That's where astrology comes from. But, you know, I, I get, sometimes I get pretty ticked off being called an astrologer. Astrology, you know, my forays into the astrological field have brought me nothing but pain. I get insulted and humiliated a lot. You know, it is just what it is. It, it's part of the what you call astrology, what people today call astrology, because it's a field that is a pseudoscientific field. It's not really contained within anything. There are no barriers. There's, there's nothing, really. You read a few books and you can just start repeating what you read in those books and call yourself an astrologer and all that so there's a little bit astrology is not i am not an astrologer if you haven't made that connection by now i think you should i'm not an astrologer i write a lot on astrology i talk a lot on astrology but i'm not an astrologer all those ideas are coming from somewhere and if you listen to my type of astrology you will realize that it is quite different from the astrology that you find in books why because it is backed by my science by my science. Now, most scientists don't consider astrology anything, but, you know, it took 
time for us for scientists to come to the realization that the earth went around the sun for people philosophers natural philosoph philosophers they weren't called scientists then to come to the realization that the earth goes around the sun so let's just say i'm ahead of the curve in that sense so if if you want to but you know just because you have all sorts of astrology today doesn't mean that all those things make sense no that's why i separated myself I started teaching my own version of, of astrology because it is backed by my type of science, my science, not the science of mainstream yet. It will get there. In, in fact, there is a very good argument that most of what I'm doing is being gradually rewritten on the ground and republished in different versions and different names and calling it different things. And I don't want to get into all that, but that, those are for political reasons. Because why does the universe have laws? It's simple. You need operators to create something. You need things to work, to operate. And you cannot create operators if you don't have constraints. The laws create the constraints and they give breath and fire to the operators to act. So the operators create spaces of possibilities, which they now weave together and engineer into realities. The realities themselves are features. These features converge as learning spaces. It is the basis, the fundamental basis for our self-awareness. Now, human beings are a reflection of these operators, these laws, a one-to-one -one reflection. You are the physical laws. There's nothing else that you are. And so, just like the physical laws themselves are a reflection of the K pattern. So you are a reflection of the K pattern. That's why you are the sixes. I know a lot of people don't want to hear this. Christians, they go crazy about this. They're like, oh no, this is... Forget about that. You are no longer children. You are the sixes. If you are a human being and you are self-aware, you are the sixes. In fact, let me blow your mind. Every cognitive, every sapient being anywhere in the universe, anywhere around whatever star, whatever sun, as long as they are sapient, meaning they are conscious of themselves, and they're conscious of their world, and they're learning, they are humankind. Yeah, they are mankind. Because mankind is not a thing per se, or the realization on earth only. Mankind is the ability of to, for the physical laws of nature to become self-aware. That's exactly what it is. And you say, okay, why did the primordial consciousness, why did it start all of this? Why, why does the universe need to be? I have podcasts that have explained that too. There, there is the long version and then there's the short version. The short version is basically that the primordial consciousness realizes possibilities. And one of the possibilities, one of the possibilities is the realization of order. A universe. Because it's like staring into a mirror. And you could talk to a lot of women. A lot of women stare into the mirror a lot. They like to look pretty. Looking pretty is not just f so they can, in a sense, impress the other sex. They derive some joy w intrinsically within them from knowing that they, are, they look beautiful, pretty and appealing. Or they can make themselves look pretty and appealing. There is a transfer of joy. And to call it joy is not the appropriate term. The closest term I can find for such an experience is ecstasy. And it's not the ecstasy that you derive through having an orgasm. That is a very poor version of it. The ecstasy I'm talking about is beyond description. There are no words that you can actually attach to it that can help you to understand precisely what it is. Because the best... A human being will ever do if you don't experience it is maybe the orgasm it's really what it is but there's a relationship between that ecstasy and the orgasm which is too complicated i don't want to go into here but that's really the, now the long version is very very complicated and you know and may sound weird but it revolves around something something to do with boredom. I mean, think of, think of it this way, right? If you are an eternal being, you can do whatever you want. You can create whatever you want. Do you know how much the fear of death zaps human life? The fear of death is what makes us have desires that we pursue. 
especially in the way that we pursue them. It is the sense of urgency, the fact that we know that life is limited. It creates, it constrains us in such a way that we immediately intuit a purpose. It helps us to see meaning and connection and things like that. It's, it's literally like a fire under our ass, so to speak. And you need to, when, when you realize that your time is short, that you, you don't have time, as much time anymore, there is a sense, the, the human mind begins to change. It begins to transform and, and people, you know, like people facing terminal illnesses or people who know that the end is near, or, the mind begins to, to transform itself into certain reality types certain understandings. Now, if you replace that with a mind that knows that it can never die, that death is nothing, it will will never experience the cessation of its self-awareness, then the human human is transformed completely. It's it's just beyond belief what, what happens to a human when that kind of baggage is dropped from the human. Now, after... A trillion years, if you have to keep track of time, even though you experience no time, after a trillion years, it's most likely that you'll be struggling for meaning, purpose. After a trillion trillion years, or infinite time, after a trillion raised to a power trillion, raised to another power trillion, raised to another power trillion, all the way as much as you can as you can go, you would still have infinite time left. What would you do? What would you create? What would you? How would you keep yourself? How would you retain structure, meaning? How would you retain? You know, these are hypothetical questions, obviously, but you need to consider them realistically if you really need to understand what is going on. Personally, I think humans will eventually conquer death when the time comes, not as a result of some science and tech. No, as a fundamental understanding of the K-pattern. There is something about the nature of human reality, because like I told you, existence itself is like a fluid. Within that fluid, that fluid, the nature of the fluid is that it can represent order. That's its nature. Whatever pattern is impressed on it, it can represent that pattern. Now, the key, the, the, the... nature of that pattern is that it must find sustainability if it is to progress within the fluid. Because what I'm describing to you are just the nature of the five principles. I've just been describing it using other terms. But this, when you read my book, The Five Principles of Organized Complexity, this is essentially what I write. It's just that I don't write it in these terms. I try to sound very scientific because I'm, I'm basically writing for an audience who I believe is scientific. So the purpose of man, of humankind right, is to mimic the K pattern. But you see, the journey to mimicking the K pattern can only begin when you realize that you are a representation of the K pattern. You are not the K pattern, you are a representation of it. It's like saying, or it's like saying the roots of a tree are its branches, but the branches of a tree are not its roots. You can cut off the branches, they will grow back in a sense. But once you kill the roots, that's the end of the tree. So you can imagine the primordial consciousness, the K-pattern that emerges from it as the root. And every, everything in existence are branches. Now, humans or humankind anywhere in the universe are special type of branches because they have achieved, they have evolved the sufficient complexity enough to be able to spark or ignite layers of self-awareness so they have begun to mimic the k pattern in their heads which is what is what self-awareness really is and that's why i say that the human being humankind are the sixes you know i could you know just to give one or two examples in your your vision 
Human vision is made possible by something called an LGN, the lateral geniculate nucleus. This LGN divided into six layers. Everywhere you find, you need, everywhere within the human body where you need precise delineation, precise resolution of multiplicities, nature employs the sixes. That's really what it is. Because in my work, you can reduce the entirety of the distribution of prime numbers to a propagation of these sixes. And when they begin to resolve themselves, they become hierarchical and they form these gradient structures. Doesn't matter whether you, you call it physics or biology or whatever. Doesn't really matter. Okay? So, what we experience as self-awareness, the limitation that we experience as self-awareness on the planet Earth, is really just a, a very squeezed up version of what we are. Because what we are, it forms the opening session that I teach in my astrology classes. I start with why does astrology work? And I cannot explain to you why astrology works if I don't teach, if I, I don't demonstrate what humans are, where they come from. And if you can see or if you can understand where a human comes from, then what becomes of a human when the life experience is over becomes immediately apparent also. There's really nothing mystical about it. I like to call it the physics of blackness or the physics of darkness or whatever you want to call it. Because, you know, I, I talked about when something is unknown, you know, it appears dark to the mind or black. You say dark energy, dark matter, because it's unknown what it really is. The sixes also control the relationship between baryonic matter and dark matter anyway. The ratio of six to one. You can look that up. And that tells you exactly what it is that, you know, that confirms what I'm talking about regarding the Big Bang. Because I told you before, I said, look, prime locations are controlled by the sixes. And in my, in my, the opening, the cover page of my book basically tells you that the sixes are responsible for everything you consider to be the physical sciences, natural physics or natural philosophy or natural whatever, the study of the universe. So, some of these things I'm talking about are also contained within your religious texts, but they are obfuscated. Now, it's a debate. It's a great debate whether the obfuscation is deliberate or not. It still doesn't change the fact that it is obfuscated. So when you look at, I mean, where did Christianity come from? Where did Islam come from? Where did Judaism come from? If you trace these things to their origins, you will realize that there was a science, there was an understanding that birthed all of these. I don't know how clear that understanding was, because it's an understanding from a long, long time ago. But it is an understanding that needs to return to the world because the understanding came from the fact that the human, the self-questioning being, began to be aware of the primordial consciousness, God. From there, once that relationship is established, then every possible thing that can be known is established. But when this relationship breaks, then the human loses access to their cognition. They cannot see anymore. And when you when your mind when cognition is lost like that, then it can be your mind can be replaced by all sorts of things. And when humankinds are in that kind of fallen state, then evil becomes possible and what evil is basically just ignorance it's you know it's <laughs> think of it this way children don't really know what to do they're not that's why there's no responsibility conferred on them because they're not in they, they don't have the fullness of their minds they're not aware of themselves in that sense so they're considered minors doesn't matter what they say or whatever you know that's the same reason the falling state is not that humanity fell into some whatever. It's, that, it's the fact that people just became minors. They no longer understood that they are one with this 
the key pattern. They are one in the sense, you know, they are connected to the primordial consciousness. And the connection does not require belief, doesn't require religion. It's not something that you can even separate yourself from. It's constantly that without it, you cannot be. So in order to change this state, in order for people to stop becoming minors and then to grow up, they need to move away from the narratives as they are. They need to begin to understand that the narratives themselves are obfuscating. So the first bet is not to take anything of the narratives, uh, literally. You know, it's like you take a banana, you have to peel out its outer layers to be able to enjoy the fruit underneath, the succulent fruit underneath. You wouldn't just get a banana and then eat it. If you saw someone doing that, you'd probably think one or two things about the person. But that's exactly what we're doing as human beings on this planet. We live and we live in a deliberate state of ignorance. I call it deliberate now because there's so much available that a human being can aspire to, you know, in terms of raising the cognition. The resonance is always there because you don't need any conduit to God. It's, it, the conduit is always there, it's just that are you aware of it? From that conduit comes an infinite amount of understanding. Any type of understanding that you want. And if you're trying to build a world where 8 billion or 9 billion or even 100 billion people can live in peace and prosperity and in enjoyment, you can get that knowledge. The only thing preventing that knowledge is the understanding of how to implement such a thing. And when you have these counter-narratives that tell you that human beings are meaningless, existence is meaningless, human beings are a plague, human beings destroy the planet, human beings are always fighting war. Well, that's a behavior, that's a choice. You can choose to do something differently. You can choose to think in a different way. But there are, sent, there are structures that have now invested in maintaining this impoverished state of humanity. Those structures cannot last. I mean, they've only continued so much because that is the time that was allotted to them. But now, with Pluto's entry into Aquarius and Saturn's entry into Pisces, all of that is done. It's finished. Now, people think that the change will take years and this is going to be extremely rapid. We're talking months. As the world breaks down significantly, it's exponential because it's, it's time. Now, the awareness and what's going to change really, it's the awareness awareness of these things I'm talking about which means a confrontation with the old order or the old the f humankind in a fallen state let me put it that way instead of humankind in an enlightened state it is enlightenment that comes from God that leads to peace and prosperity and the end of human parasitism in the world you say oh this can never be it's simply because you don't know how You don't know how. You don't know how because the knowledge hasn't been downloaded from God. And it's not a knowledge that is like your physics or your chemistry. No, those things don't change your behavior. Even religion with all this tech don't, didn't change human behavior. It even made it worse. So we're talking about a different type of understanding. One that once you touch it, you realize with an absolute certainty that it is true. You don't need anybody to sell anything to you. You don't need anybody to convince you. you don't need, once you touch it, once you come face to face with it, you realize for an absolute fact that it is true. That's the type of knowledge that changes you. Because it's knowledge of yourself. You see the link? You see why I write about astrology? You see why I do my sessions? You see why I teach my sessions? Now, I'm wary about teaching, or, you know, op just open, you know, I select because unfortunately, you know, within the whatever of humanity, you will always find the cesspit and the cesspool of people, people who have degraded so far, all right, that all you can do is just pray for them. Okay, so this is not going to be a, one of those posts. And the reason why the supreme intelligence instantiated the physical universe is because a question needed to be resolved.
As soon as the question arose, a physical universe was instantiated to answer the question. That question is humankind. That is why humankind is a self-questioning entity. And everything in biological evolution is directed towards the emergence of beings that can question themselves and question their reality because the original question revolves around the nature of the supreme intelligence. Now, normally such a question does not arise, but I've, I've explained how periodically or it's stupid to talk about periodically because in the in the in the realm of that supreme intelligence there's no time so what does periodically mean when i mean there's no time it doesn't mean that things don't change state it simply means that things don't degrade they do not fall apart they do not age everything that is has always been and will always continue to be so things change reconfigure but they do not degrade. Life that lives has always lived and will always live. So there is no death. You know, the meaning of time would be, would be so different to us if we didn't die, if we didn't degrade, if we literally didn't fall apart. We would be able to conceive time very differently. We would see changes in the universe. But those things won't really mean anything to us because we don't fall apart, we don't age, and we don't die. And that would change our behavior intrinsically, the recognition that we're eternal beings. In some sense, I am convinced that this is the future of humanity. But before we can transition, we must realize the truth. We must realize the truth of existence where it comes from what it is so we must realize who we are and once that realization sits within us as a conviction then nobody will die anymore there will be no death anymore and that's why this message is important because it is the beginning stages of the journey towards the maker the journey back to the maker which I think is what this whole manifestation of existence is really all about. So when you look at my model for cosmic inflation, or my mo when you look at my model, basically my model, you see a physics within that model that sheds light on modern day physics. It shed light, sheds light on Einstein's general theory of relativity, including the special theory of relativity. What we call the special theory really is an effect that is contained within the mo These properties of these physics, they come from somewhere. They come, obviously, from the... They are related to the quantum realm. It's just that physicists haven't been able to connect them in a generally acceptable framework. My model is a connection, not just from what you consider to be general theory of relativity or, or the special theory. It is also a model that contains what, you under, what we understand about quantum theory. So essentially, it is a unification of all these models. And it is a model that ultimately I have used to describe organized complexity. So it explains the extreme small, the extreme large, and then the middle, where we humans... Uh, uh, propagate and proliferate. Like I said, the, the complexity appears to be within this middle scale. It doesn't exist in the larger scale, on the larger scales and on the smaller scales. And the question is why? Well, it becomes clear that the complexity is a is a is a measure of perception. Because when we look at the very large and the very small, our perception is smoothened out. We can describe the planet Mars, for instance, as a, uh, a tidy little, a tidy sphere. We can ignore the fact that it has hills, valleys, and you know the surface is not flat. For all intents and purposes, the universe sees the planet Mars too that way. Now, it doesn't mean that 
it doesn't the universe does not take into account the rugged surface of mars it does but all of that seems to be smoother the way when you're thinking about the general properties of the gravitating effects of mars so there is Even though, you know, all aspects of the gravity, the, the universe treats Mars not just as a spherical, it also treats it as a quantum phenomenon. But all of that is smoothing out. And if we have to calculate the gravitational effects of Mars and treat it like, as, as if it's made up of, you know, an uncountable number of quantum particles, then the computation becomes nonsensical. Because gravity on that level is extremely weak. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying that the nature of complexity that we perceive on the everyday scale is tied to our perception. Because whether we can perceive it or not, the same simplicity that exists on a smaller scale and on a larger scale also exists on our everyday scale. The first question is, what is so simplistic about the nature of turbulence? I mean, the nature of chaotic flow, chaotic motion. These are some non-linear behavior. These are some of the most intractable uh, mathematical uh, equations to solve. How can you say that they are simplistic, as simplistic as the linear, the linearized form that is quantum mechanics? And I'm saying that, yes, because if we change our scale, if we changed, if we suddenly became as large as the universe itself and we looked at our everyday reality, it will also appear linear. The chaos will disappear. So what is it about scale that transforms the universe? Should the universe not be scale invariant? Should the laws of physics not be the same on whatever scale you're looking at? Well, it doesn't appear to be the case. The universe appears to, not the universe per se, but perception, human perception, appears to be tied to scale. It is my own view that the universe does not really care about scales. It cares about extensions, shifts, and intervals. But it doesn't care at what scale, energy, time, that these intervals or shifts are occurring in. That's why you can have the smallest quark and the largest quark in terms of mass to be separated by several orders of magnitude. Because the universe doesn't see those orders of magnitudes per se. It just sees an interval that it needs to maintain. And if that translates into orders of magnitudes on, on the energy scale, then so be it. What I'm trying to say is that it is very possible that the big, what we consider to be the big bang of cosmic, inf cosmic inflation was really just a big shrink. Like I told you, infinity is contained between the number zero and one, just like infinity is also contained between one and infinity infinitely large and infinitely small they're both infinities so if you take a snapshot of a unit length you can divide it into infinitely many segments almost as sure as you can have one to infinity and each segment you can number one to infinity and you can continue doing that between no matter the unit length you take, you can always divide it into infinitely many sections, into infinitely many parts. It's not, you know, what we're really doing is our ability to imagine relational order is infinite. Our ability, our perspicacity for Im relational order is infinite. We can imagine an infinite number of infinities. As long as these are tied to relational order. 
And if the universe, the physical universe, is a snapshot of any of these units' lengths, then the universe would be infinite too, even though it is infinitely small compared to other infinities. So, when we look at the universe, we're not looking at physical things. We're not looking at a physical... There's really nothing... It, it looks physical because it's three-dimensional. And because we're in it, tied to it, entangled with it. But what it really is... Is a K-pattern. It's a concept space. It's an imaginative space. And within that imagination... We are privy to infinitely many patterns. Each pattern can generate its own infinity. And all of that is represented as a physical universe. So what does that mean for the instantiation of existence as a physical universe? It means that there is no end. There's really no end and there's really no beginning. What we see as the birth of the singularity of the universe is always occurring. It continues to occur. It, it occurred, it is occurring, and will always be occurring. What we see as the cosmic inflation, all these things, they, will con they have occurred. They are occurring, and they will continue to occur. That is the structure It's like the fractal nature of a Mandelbrot set or a Julia set. No matter how deep you go into the fractal, you keep seeing self-similarity and repeatability. Because you're not really changing scales. The computer just, when the computer images this for you, it just keeps generating and regenerating this thing. So there's really no bottom there's no end to it because it is infinitely generative and that's exactly what the universe is it's infinitely regenerative infinitely generative that's why it has no end the very idea of an end misses the entire mark or the very idea of boundaries because it means that we're really thinking of this universe as something it is nothing it will always be nothing and all its properties are structured in such a way as to maintain it as nothing. But because we are in it, we are tied to it, we are entangled to it, we see it as something. Because we must give ourselves form, we must take form within it. So we have a form within it and that form is tied to the realization of the form of the universe. So we perceive it as a three-dimensional reality. But what it is really is that it is nothing. It is the a concept. Or you could even say the imagination of the supreme intelligence who has thrown this out as a realization in order to re be able to resolve a question. And so when beings emerge within such a realization who are able to question themselves to the point where they realize what they are, what the universe is, and who the supreme intelligence is. The process of conviction resolves the entire universe back into nothing. Because its only, exist its only reason for existence has now been satisfied. The question has been answered. And once that happens, the universe closes down, you know, if whatever way you want to imagine such a closure to be. What it is, is the universe just resolves back into nothing. And you as an individual or as, a, as an entity, you resolve also back into nothing. It doesn't mean that you disappear. But the original form is without space. It's without time. It's without form. And you will not miss your form. You would not even question the fact that you have no form. 
you wouldn't notice that you have no form because form is a construct from the three-dimensional uh, manifestation of existence. And so without form, there's no time, there's nothing to degrade. The only experience of change that you have is your changing state of awareness. And because you have resolved back into the supreme intelligence, then your state of awareness begins to, it mimics that of the supreme intelligence, which is what it was trying to do in a, in a, in a 3D form. And so that resolution is access to all that can be known. Because that's what it is. That's what it's all about in the first place. Realization. That's really what it is. So when you look at my model and you begin to piece these ideas together, you see that the, my model suggests inflation taking place. The interesting thing is that my model is very similar to, because my model is on a two-dimensional plane, even though the inflation itself, or the expansion itself is taking place in more than two dimensions. But just to be able to represent it on paper, I've represented it as a two-dimensional expansion that is very similar to the Starobinsky model of cosmic inflation. In fact, when you look at the, the, the imagery of the Starobinsky model, uh, model of inflation it is almost exactly similar to my model and my model is generated from the natural numbers and from the distribution of prime numbers i mean and this this evidence will only grow because what we are supposed to do is to get to the realization that we are in nothing we are in a concept a numerical concept, a pattern, a K pattern, okay? Let me don't just restrict it to numerical concepts. We are in a K pattern. We are in a K pattern because the K pattern is us. We are not it, not yet. It's what we're trying to be. That's what the question really is all about. We need to be it. To try to be it, we'll never be it exactly and retain our self, our, some modicum of self-identity. The fact that we must retain some sense of self means that we will never really be it. But it is us. So in that sense, there's a cyclical iterative process where it generates us and then we try to be it. And then it generates us and then we try to be it. And that, you know, you can almost say that it is the way that it grows. But since it cannot really change because it has no form and it's the supreme intelligence, it's the only benefit I surmise is that this process gives it an absolute degree of pleasure, satisfaction. That's, we can only think of it from the point of view that we have. We have no idea to know exactly why, but we surmise. Now, this is not a, a kind of thinking that most scientists adopt. Most scientists don't want to include the existence of a supreme intelligence or a primordial consciousness. There's a theory that says that uh, the universe, universes start because these ob objects called brains collide with each other and all that. But you still, you're just postponing the problem because at the end of the day, you're still going to have to explain where brains come from. And if you explain brains through another causative factor, then you're going to have to explain where that, caus where that causative factor actually comes from. And it becomes a reductionist nightmare. It doesn't end. So you never truly find a course. This should be very obvious. It's just a way of, you know, of prolonging physics unnecessarily. The reality of the matter is that the K pattern comes from a supreme intelligence. I call it a supreme intelligence. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it God. You can call it whatever you want. But that's where the K pattern comes from. And the evidence is the fact that a concept cannot exist without anything to conceptualize it. And something like the distribution of prime numbers is. It was here before we became self-aware. It has always been. Now, if it is, it's not just the K pattern. You know, the K pattern I see as the, um, the irreducible form of that pattern of the, of the relational order itself. But it could be any mathematical truth or any geometric truth. As long as you have a space, geometry must exist. 
So the, the idea of a space as a concept must contain geometric truths or geometric realities. But the idea of relational order as captured by the natural numbers or the number system or whatever, it is. It simply has always been. Now, such a concept of relational order cannot exist if there's nothing to give meaning to that concept. So the original concept space, which I call the K-pattern, is held by the supreme intelligence, the primordial consciousness. That is the origin of every single thing. That's it. That's my dialogue.